This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Barnes, www.414.org.uk Confessions by St. Augustine Translated by Albert C. Outler Book 1 Chapter 1 Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and infinite is thy wisdom. And man desires to praise thee, for he is a part of thy creation. He bears his mortality about with him, and carries the evidence of his sin, and the proof that thou dost resist the proud. Still he desires to praise thee, this man who is only a small part of thy creation. Thou hast prompted him, that he should delight to praise thee, for thou hast made us for thyself, and restless is our heart until it comes to rest in thee. Grant me, O Lord, to know and understand whether first to invoke thee or to praise thee, whether first to know thee or call upon thee. But who can invoke thee, knowing thee not? For he who knows thee not may invoke thee as another than thou art. It may be that we should invoke thee in order that we may come to know thee. But how shall I call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe without a preacher? Now, they shall praise the Lord who seek him, for those who seek him shall find him, and finding him shall praise him. I will seek thee, O Lord, and call upon thee. I call upon thee, O Lord, in my faith which thou hast given me, which thou hast inspired in me through the humanity of thy Son and through the ministry of thy preacher. Chapter 2 And how shall I call upon my God, my God and my Lord? For when I call on him, I ask him to come into me. And what place is there in me into which my God can come? How could God, the God who made both heaven and earth, come into me? Is there anything in me, O Lord my God, that can contain thee? Do even the heaven and the earth which thou hast made, and in which thou didst make me, contain thee? Is it possible that since without thee nothing would be which does exist, thou didst make it so that whatever exists has some capacity to receive thee? Why then do I ask thee to come into me, since I also am, and could not be if thou wert not in me? For I am not, after all, in hell. And yet thou art there too, for, if I go down into hell, thou art there. Therefore I would not exist, I would simply not be at all, unless I exist in thee, from whom and by whom and in whom all things are. Even so, Lord, even so. Where do I call thee to, when I am already in thee? Or from whence wouldst thou come into me? Where, beyond heaven and earth, could I go, that there my God might come to me, he who hath said, I fill heaven and earth? Chapter 3 Since then thou dost fill the heaven and the earth, do they contain thee? Or dost thou fill and overflow them, because they cannot contain thee? And where dost thou pour out what remains of thee, after heaven and earth are full? Or indeed, is there no need that thou, who dost contain all things, should be contained by any, since those things which thou dost fill thou fillest by containing them? For the vessels which thou dost fill do not confine thee, since even if they were broken thou wouldst not be poured out. And, when thou art poured out on us, thou art not thereby brought down, rather we are uplifted. Thou art not scattered, Rather, thou dost gather us together. But when thou dost fill all things, dost thou fill them with thy whole being? Or, since not even all things together could contain thee altogether, does any one thing contain a single part? And do all things contain that same part at the same time? Do singulars contain thee singly? 
Do greater things contain more of thee and smaller things less? Or is it not rather that thou art wholly present everywhere, yet in such a way that nothing contains thee wholly? Chapter 4 What therefore is my God? What, I ask, but the Lord God? For who is Lord but the Lord himself, or who is God besides our God? Most high, most excellent, most potent, most omnipotent, most merciful and most just, most secret and most truly present, most beautiful and most strong, stable yet not supported, unchangeable yet changing all things, never new, never old, making all things new, yet bringing old age upon the proud and they know it not, always working, ever at rest, gathering, yet needing nothing, sustaining, pervading and protecting, creating, nourishing and developing, seeking and yet possessing all things. Thou dost love, but without passion, art jealous, yet free from care, dost repent without remorse, art angry, yet remainest serene. Thou changest thy ways, leaving thy plans unchanged. Thou recoverest what thou hast never really lost. Thou art never in need, but still thou dost rejoice at thy gains. Art never greedy, yet demandest dividends. Men pay more than is required, so that thou dost become a debtor. Yet who can possess anything at all which is not already thine? Thou owest men nothing, yet payest out to them as if in debt to thy creature. And when thou dost cancel debts, thou losest nothing thereby. Yet, O oh my God, my life, my holy joy, what is this that I have said? What can any man say when he speaks of thee? But woe to them that keep silence, since even those who say most are dumb. Chapter 5 Who shall bring me to rest in thee? Who will send thee into my heart, so to overwhelm it that my sin shall be blotted out, and I may embrace thee, my only good? What art thou to me? Have mercy, that I may speak. What am I to thee, that thou shouldst command me to love thee? And if I do it not, art angry and threatenest vast misery. Is it then a trifling sorrow not to love thee? It is not so to me. Tell me, by thy mercy, O Lord my God, what thou art to me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. So speak, that I may hear. Behold, the ears of my heart are before thee, O Lord. Open them, and say to my soul, I am your salvation. I will hasten after that voice and I will lay hold upon thee. Hide not thy face from me. Even if I die, let me see thy face, lest I die. The house of my soul is too narrow for thee to come into me. Let it be enlarged by thee. It is in ruins. Do thou restore it. There is much about it which must offend thy eyes. I confess and know it. But who will cleanse it? Or, to whom shall I cry but to thee? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults, O Lord, and keep back thy servant from strange sins. I believe, and therefore do I speak. But thou, O Lord, thou knowest. Have I not confessed my transgressions unto thee, O my God? And hast thou not put away the iniquity of my heart? I do not contend in judgment with thee, who art truth itself. And I would not deceive myself, lest my iniquity lie even to itself. I do not therefore contend in judgment with thee. For if thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Chapter 6 Still, dust and ashes as I am, allow me to speak before thy mercy. Allow me to speak, for behold, 
it is to thy mercy that I speak, and not to a man who scorns me. Yet perhaps even thou mightest scorn me. But when thou dost turn and attend to me, thou wilt have mercy upon me. For what do I wish to say, O Lord my God, but that I know not whence I came hither into this life in death? Or should I call it death in life? I do not know. And yet the consolations of thy mercy have sustained me from the very beginning, as I have heard from my fleshly parents, from whom and in whom thou didst form me in time. For I cannot myself remember. Thus, even though they sustained me by the consolation of woman's milk, neither my mother nor my nurses filled their own breasts, but thou, through them, didst give me the food of infancy according to thy ordinance and thy bounty which underlie all things. For it was thou who didst cause me not to want more than thou gavest, and it was thou who gavest to those who nourished me the will to give me what thou didst give them. And they, by an instinctive affection, were willing to give me what thou hadst supplied abundantly. It was, indeed, good for them that my good should come through them, though in truth it was not from them, but by them. For it is from thee, O God, that all good things come, and from my God is all my health. This is what I have since learned, as thou hast made it abundantly clear by all that I have seen thee give, both to me and to those around me. For even at the very first I knew how to suck, to lie quiet when I was full, and to cry when in pain, nothing more. Afterward, I began to laugh, at first in my sleep, then when waking. For this I have been told about myself, and I believe it, though I cannot remember it, for I see the same things in other infants. Then, little by little, I realized where I was, and wished to tell my wishes to those who might satisfy them, but I could not, for my wants were inside me, and they were outside, and they could not by any power of theirs come into my soul. And so I would fling my arms and legs about and cry, making the few and feeble gestures that I could, though indeed the signs were not much like what I inwardly desired, and when I was not satisfied either from not being understood or because what I got was not good for me. I grew indignant that my elders were not subject to me and that those on whom I actually had no claim did not wait on me as slaves, and I avenged myself on them by crying. That infants are like this, I have myself been able to learn by watching them, and they, though they knew me not, have shown me better what I was like than my own nurses who knew me. And behold, my infancy died long ago, but I am still living. But thou, O Lord, whose life is forever and in whom nothing dies, since before the world was, indeed, before all that can be called before, thou wast, and thou art the God and Lord of all thy creatures, and with thee abide all the stable causes of all unstable things, the unchanging sources of all changeable things, and the eternal reasons of non-rational and temporal things. Tell me, thy suppliant, O God, tell me, O merciful one, in pity tell a pitiful creature whether my infancy followed yet another earlier age of my life that had already passed away before it. Was it such another age which I spent in my mother's womb? For something of that sort has been suggested to me, and I have myself seen pregnant women. But what, O oh God, my joy, preceded that period of my life? Was I indeed anywhere or anybody? No one can explain these things to me, neither father nor mother, nor the experience of others, nor my own memory. Dost thou laugh at me for asking such things? 
or dost thou command me to praise and confess unto thee only what I know? I give thanks to thee, O Lord of heaven and earth, giving praise to thee for that first being and my infancy of which I have no memory. For thou hast granted to man that he should come to self-knowledge through the knowledge of others, and that he should believe many things about himself on the authority of the womenfolk. Now, clearly, I had life and being, and, as my infancy closed, I was already learning signs by which my feelings could be communicated to others. Whence could such a creature come but from thee, O Lord? Is any man skillful enough to have fashioned himself? Or is there any other source from which being and life could flow into us save this, that thou, O Lord, hast made us, thou with whom being and life are one, since thou thyself art supreme being and supreme life both together? For thou art infinite, and in thee there is no change, nor an end to this present day although there is a sense in which it ends in thee, since all things are in thee, and there would be no such thing as days passing away unless thou didst sustain them. And since thy years shall have no end, thy years are an ever-present day. And how many of ours and our father's days have passed through this thy day, and have received from it what measure and fashion of being they had, and all the days to come shall so receive, and so pass away. But thou art the same, and all the things of tomorrow, and the days yet to come, and all of yesterday and the days that are past, thou wilt gather into this thy day. What is it to me if someone does not understand this? Let him still rejoice and continue to ask, What is this? Let him also rejoice and prefer to seek thee, even if he fails to find an answer, rather than to seek an answer and not find thee. Chapter 7 Hear me, O God, woe to the sins of men. When a man cries thus, thou showest him mercy, for thou didst create the man, but not the sin in him. Who brings to remembrance the sins of my infancy? For in thy sight there is none free from sin, not even the infant who has lived but a day upon this earth. Who brings this to my remembrance? Does not each little one, in whom I now observe what I no longer remember of myself? In what ways, in that time, did I sin? Was it that I cried for the breast? If I should now so cry, not indeed for the breast, but for food suitable to my condition, I should be most justly laughed at and rebuked. What I did then deserved rebuke, but, since I could not understand those who rebuked me, neither custom nor common sense permitted me to be rebuked. As we grow, we root out and cast away from us such childish habits. Yet I have not seen anyone who is wise and who cast away the good when trying to purge the bad. Nor was it good, even in that time, to strive to get by crying what, if it had been given to me, would have been hurtful, or to be bitterly indignant at those who, because they were older, not slaves either, but free, and wiser than I, would not indulge my capricious desires. Was it a good thing for me to try, by struggling as hard as I could, to harm them for not obeying me, even when it would have done me harm to have been obeyed? Thus, the infant's innocence lies in the weakness of his body, and not in the infant mind. I have myself observed a baby to be jealous, though it could not speak. It was livid as it watched another infant at the breast. Who is ignorant of this? Mothers and nurses tell us that they cure these things by I know not what remedies. But is this innocence, when the fountain of milk is flowing fresh and abundant, that another who needs it should not be allowed to share it, even though he requires such nourishment to sustain his life? Yet we look leniently on such things, not because they are not faults, or even small faults, but because they will vanish as the years pass. For, although we allow for such things in an infant, the same things could not be tolerated patiently in an adult. Therefore, 
O Lord my God, thou who gavest life to the infant and a body which, as we see, thou hast furnished with senses, shaped with limbs, beautified with form, and endowed with all vital energies for its well-being and health. Thou dost command me to praise thee for these things, to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praise unto his name, O Most High. For thou art God, omnipotent and good, even if thou hadst done no more than these things, which no other but thou canst do. Thou alone who madest all things fair and didst order everything according to thy law. I am loath to dwell on this part of my life of which, O Lord, I have no remembrance, about which I must trust the word of others and what I can surmise from observing other infants, even if such guesses are trustworthy. For it lies in the deep murk of my forgetfulness and thus is like the period which I passed in my mother's womb. But if I was conceived in iniquity and in sin my mother nourished me in her womb, where, I pray thee, O my God, where, O Lord, or when was I, thy servant, ever innocent? But see now, I pass over that period. For what have I to do with a time from which I can recall no memories? Chapter 8 Did I not then, as I grew out of infancy, come next to boyhood? Or rather, did it not come to me and succeed my infancy? My infancy did not go away, for where would it go? It was simply no longer present. I was no longer an infant who could not speak, but now a chattering boy. I remember this, and I have since observed how I learned to speak. My elders did not teach me words by rote, as they taught me letters afterwards. But I myself, when I was unable to communicate all I wished to say to whomever I wished by means of whimperings and grunts and various gestures of my limbs, which I used to reinforce my demands, I myself repeated the sounds already stored in my memory by the mind which thou, O God, hast given me. When they called something by name and pointed it out while they spoke, I saw it and realized that the thing they wished to indicate was called by the name they then uttered. And what they meant was made plain by the gestures of their bodies, by a kind of natural language common to all nations which expresses itself through changes of countenance, glances of an eye, gestures and intonations which indicate a disposition and attitude, either to seek or to possess to reject or to avoid. So it was that by frequently hearing words in different phrases, I gradually identified the objects which the words stood for, and, having formed my mouth to repeat these signs, I was thereby able to express my will. Thus, I exchanged with those about me the verbal signs by which we express our wishes and advance deeper into the stormy fellowship of human life depending all the while upon the authority of my parents and the behest of my elders. Chapter 9 O oh my God, what miseries and mockeries did I then experience when it was impressed on me that obedience to my teachers was proper to my boyhood estate if I was to flourish in this world and distinguish myself in those tricks of speech which would gain honor for me among men and deceitful riches. To this end, I was sent to school to get learning, the value of which I knew not, wretch that I was. Yet, if I was slow to learn, I was flogged, for this was deemed praiseworthy by our forefathers, and many had passed before us in the same course, and thus had built up the precedent for the sorrowful road on which we too were compelled to travel, multiplying labor and sorrow upon the sons of Adam. About this time, O Lord, I observed men praying to thee, and I learned from them to conceive thee, after my capacity for understanding as it was then, to be some great being who, though not visible to our senses, was able to hear and help us. Thus, as a boy, I began to pray to thee, my help and my refuge, and, in calling on thee, broke the bands of my tongue. Small as I was, I prayed with no slight earnestness that I might not be beaten at school. And, when thou didst not heed me, 
for that would have been giving me over to my folly, my elders and even my parents too, who wished me no ill, treated my stripes as a joke, though they were then a great and grievous ill to me. Is there any one, O Lord, with a spirit so great, who cleaves to thee with such steadfast affection? Or is there even a kind of obtuseness that has the same effect? Is there any man who by cleaving devoutly to thee is endowed with so great a courage that he can regard indifferently those racks and hooks and other torture weapons from which men throughout the world pray so fervently to be spared? And can they scorn those who so greatly fear these torments, just as my parents were amused at the torments with which our teachers punished us boys? For we were no less afraid of our pains, nor did we beseech thee less to escape them. Yet, even so, we were sinning by writing or reading or studying less than our assigned lessons. For I did not, O Lord, lack memory or capacity, for by thy will I possessed enough for my age. However, my mind was absorbed only in play, and I was punished for this by those who were doing the same things themselves. But the idling of our elders is called business. The idling of boys, though quite like it, is punished by those same elders, and no one pities either the boys or the men. For will any common-sense observer agree that I was rightly punished as a boy for playing ball, just because this hindered me from learning more quickly those lessons by means of which, as a man, I could play at more shameful games? And did he by whom I was beaten do anything different? When he was worsted in some small controversy with a fellow teacher, he was more tormented by anger and envy than I was when beaten by a playmate in the ball game. Chapter 10 And yet I sinned, O Lord my God, thou ruler and creator of all natural things, but of sins only the ruler. I sinned, O Lord my God, in acting against the precepts of my parents and of those teachers. For this learning which they wished me to acquire, no matter what their motives were, I might have put to good account afterward. I disobeyed them, not because I had chosen a better way, but from a sheer love of play. I love the vanity of victory. I love to have my ears tickled with lying fables, which made them itch even more ardently, and a similar curiosity glowed more and more in my eyes for the shows and sports of my elders. Yet those who put on such shows are held in such high repute that almost all desire the same for their children. They are therefore willing to have them beaten, if their childhood games keep them from the studies by which their parents desire them to grow up to be able to give such shows. Look down on these things with mercy, O Lord, and deliver us who now call upon thee. Deliver those also who do not call upon thee, that they may call upon thee, and thou, May to deliver them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Barnes, www.414.org.uk. Confessions by St. Augustine Translated by Albert C. Outler Book 1, Chapter 11 Even as a boy I had heard of eternal life promised to us through the humility of the Lord our God who came down to visit us in our pride and I was signed with the sign of his cross and was seasoned with his salt even from the womb of my mother who greatly trusted in thee Thou didst see, O Lord, how, once, while I was still a child, I was suddenly seized with stomach pains and was at the point of death. Thou didst see, O my God, for even then thou wast my keeper, 
with what agitation and with what faith I solicited from the piety of my mother and from thy church, which is the mother of us all, the baptism of thy Christ, my Lord and my God. The mother of my flesh was much perplexed, for, with a heart pure in thy faith, she was always in deep travail for my eternal salvation. If I had not quickly recovered, she would have provided forthwith for my initiation and washing by thy life-giving sacraments, confessing thee, O Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. So my cleansing was deferred, as if it were inevitable that, if I should live, I would be further polluted, and further, because the guilt contracted by sin after baptism would be still greater and more perilous. Thus, at that time, I believed, along with my mother and the whole household except my father, but he did not overcome the influence of my mother's piety in me, nor did he prevent my believing in Christ, although he had not yet believed in him. For it was her desire, O oh my God, that I should acknowledge thee as my father rather than him. In this thou didst aid her to overcome her husband, to whom, though his superior, she yielded obedience. In this way she also yielded obedience to thee, who dost so command. I ask thee, O my God, for I would gladly know, if it be thy will, to what good end my baptism was deferred at that time. Was it indeed for my good that the reins were slackened, as it were, to encourage me in sin? Or were they not slackened? If not, then why is it still dinned into our ears on all sides? Let him alone, let him do as he pleases, for he is not yet baptized. In the matter of bodily health, no one says, Let him alone, let him be worse wounded, for he is not yet cured. How much better then would it have been for me to have been cured at once? And if thereafter, through the diligent care of friends and myself, my soul's restored health had been kept safe in thy keeping, who gave it in the first place. This would have been far better in truth. But how many and great the waves of temptation which appeared to hang over me as I grew out of childhood! These were foreseen by my mother, and she preferred that the unformed clay should be risked to them rather than the clay moulded after Christ's image. Chapter 12 But in this time of childhood, which was far less dreaded for me than my adolescence, I had no love of learning and hated to be driven to it. Yet I was driven to it just the same, and good was done for me, even though I did not do it well, for I would not have learned if I had not been forced to it. For no man does well against his will, even if what he does is a good thing. Neither did they who forced me do well. But the good that was done me came from thee, my God, for they did not care about the way in which I would use what they forced me to learn, and took it for granted that it was to satisfy the inordinate desires of a rich beggary and a shameful glory. But thou, Lord, by whom the hairs of our head are numbered, didst use for my good the error of all who pushed me on to study. But my error, in not being willing to learn, thou didst use for my punishment. And I, though so small a boy, yet so great a sinner, was not punished without warrant. Thus, by the instrumentality of those who did not do well, thou didst well for me and by my own sin thou didst justly punish me. For it is even as thou hast ordained, that every inordinate affection brings on its own punishment. Chapter 13 But what were the causes for my strong dislike of Greek literature which I studied from my boyhood? Even to this day I have not fully understood them. For Latin I loved exceedingly, not just the rudiments, but what the grammarians teach. For those beginners' lessons in reading, writing, and reckoning, I considered no less a burden and pain than Greek. Yet whence came this, unless from the sin and vanity of this life? For I was but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Those first lessons were better, assuredly, because they were more certain, 
and through them I acquired and still retain the power of reading what I find written and of writing for myself what I will. In the other subjects, however, I was compelled to learn about the wanderings of a certain Aeneas, oblivious of my own wanderings, and to weep for Dido dead who slew herself for love. And all this while I bore with dry eyes my own wretched self, die unto thee, O God, my life in the midst of these things. For what can be more wretched than the wretch who has no pity upon himself, who sheds tears over Dido, dead for the love of Aeneas, but who sheds no tears for his own death in not loving thee, O God, light of my heart and bread of the inner mouth of my soul? O power that links together my mind with the inmost thoughts, I did not love thee, and thus committed fornication against thee. Those around me, also sinning, thus cried out, Well done, well done. The friendship of this world is fornication against thee, and well done, well done, is cried until one feels ashamed not to show himself a man in this way. For my own condition I shed no tears, though I wept for Dido, who sought death at the sword's point while I myself was seeking the lowest rung of thy creation, having forsaken thee, earth, sinking back to earth again. And if I had been forbidden to read these poems, I would have grieved that I was not allowed to read what grieved me. This sort of madness is considered more honorable and more fruitful learning than the beginner's course in which I learned to read and write. But now, O oh my God, Cry unto my soul, and let thy truth say to me, Not so, not so, that first learning was far better. For, obviously I would rather forget the wanderings of Aeneas and all such things than forget how to write and read. Still, over the entrance of the grammar school there hangs a veil. This is not so much the sign of a covering for a mystery as a curtain for error. Let them exclaim against me, those I no longer fear, while I confess to thee, my God, what my soul desires, and let me find some rest, for in blaming my own evil ways I may come to love thy holy ways. Neither let those cry out against me who buy and sell the baubles of literature. For if I ask them if it is true, as the poet says, that Aeneas once came to Carthage, the unlearned will reply that they do not know, and the learned will deny that it is true. But if I ask with what letters the name Aeneas is written, all who have ever learned this will answer correctly in accordance with the conventional understanding men have agreed upon as to these signs. Again, if I should ask which would cause the greatest inconvenience in our life, if it were forgotten, reading and writing, or these poetical fictions, who does not see what everyone would answer who had not entirely lost his own memory? I erred then, when as a boy I preferred those vain studies to these more profitable ones, or rather loved the one and hated the other. One and one are two, two and two are four. This was then a truly hateful song to me. But the wooden horse full of its armed soldiers and the holocaust of Troy and the spectral image of Cruiser were all a most delightful and vain show. But why then did I dislike Greek learning? which was full of such tales. For Homer was skillful in inventing such poetic fictions and is most sweetly wanton. Yet when I was a boy, he was most disagreeable to me. I believe that Virgil would have the same effect on Greek boys as Homer did on me if they were forced to learn him. For the tedium of learning a foreign language mingled gall into the sweetness of those Greek myths. For I did not understand a word of the language and yet I was driven with threats and cruel punishments to learn it. There was also a time when, as an infant, I knew no Latin, but this I acquired without any fear or tormenting, but merely by being alert on the blandishments of my nurses, the jests of those who smiled on me, and the sportiveness of those who toyed with me. I learned all this indeed, without being urged by any pressure of punishment, for my own heart urged me to bring forth its own fashioning which I could not do except by learning words. Not from those who taught me, but those who talked to me, 
into whose ears I could pour forth whatever I could fashion. From this it is sufficiently clear that a free curiosity is more effective in learning than a discipline based on fear. Yet by thy ordinance, O God, discipline is given to restrain the excesses of freedom. This ranges from the ferule of the schoolmaster to the trials of the martyr, and has the effect of mingling for us a wholesome bitterness which calls us back to thee from poisonous pleasures that first drew us from thee. Chapter 15 Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let not my soul faint under thy discipline, nor let me faint in confessing unto thee thy mercies, whereby thou hast saved me from all my most wicked ways, till thou shouldst become sweet to me beyond all the allurements that I used to follow. Let me come to love thee wholly, and grasp thy hand with my whole heart, that thou mayst deliver me from every temptation, even unto the last. And thus, O Lord, my King and my God, may all things useful that I learned as a boy now be offered in thy service. Let it be that for thy service I now speak and write and reckon. For when I was learning vain things, thou didst impose thy discipline upon me, and thou hast forgiven me my sin of delighting in those vanities. In those studies I learned many a useful word, but these might have been learned in matters not so vain, and surely that is the safe way for youths to walk in. Chapter 16 But woe unto you, O torrent of human custom! Who shall stay your course? When will you ever run dry? How long will you carry down the sons of Eve into that vast and hideous ocean which even those who have the tree for an ark can scarcely pass over? Do I not read in you the stories of Jove, the thunderer, and the adulterer? How could he be both? But so it says, and the sham thunder served as a cloak for him to play at real adultery. Yet which of our gowned masters will give a tempered hearing to a man trained in their own schools who cries out and says, These were Homer's fictions. He transfers things human to the gods. I could have wished that he would transfer divine things to us. But it would have been more true if he said, These are indeed his fictions, but he attributed divine attributes to sinful man that crimes might not be accounted crimes, and that whoever committed such crimes might appear to imitate the celestial gods and not abandoned men. And yet, O torrent of hell, the sons of men are still cast into you, and they pay fees for learning all these things. And much is made of it when this goes on in the forum under the auspices of laws which give a salary over and above the fees, and you beat against your rocky shore and roar. Here, words may be learned. Here, you can attain the eloquence which is so necessary to persuade people to your way of thinking, so helpful in unfolding your opinions. Verily, they seem to argue that we should never have understood these words, golden shower, bosom, intrigue, highest heavens, and other such words, if Terence had not introduced a good-for-nothing youth upon the stage, setting up a picture of Jove as his example of lewdness, and telling the tale of Jove's descending in a golden shower into Dana's bosom with a woman to intrigue. See how he excites himself to lust, as if by a heavenly authority, when he says, Great Jove, who shakes the highest heavens with his thunder, shall I poor mortal man, not do the same? I've done it, and with all my heart I'm glad. These words are not learned one whit more easily because of this vileness, but through them the vileness is more boldly perpetrated. I do not blame the words, for they, as it were, choice and precious vessels. But I do deplore the wine of error which was poured out to us by teachers already drunk, and Unless we also drank, we were beaten, without liberty of appeal to a sober judge. And yet, O oh my God, in whose presence I can now with security recall this, I learned these things willingly and with delight, and for it I was called a boy of good promise. Chapter 17 Bear with me, O oh my God, 
while I speak a little of those talents, thy gifts, and of the follies on which I wasted them? For a lesson was given me that sufficiently disturbed my soul, for in it there was both hope of praise and fear of shame or stripes. The assignment was that I should declaim the words of Juno, as she raged and sorrowed that she could not bar off Italy from all the approaches of the Teucrian king. I had learned that Juno had never uttered these words, and yet we were compelled to stray in the footsteps of these poetic fictions and to turn into prose what the poet had said in verse. In the declamation, the boy won most applause whose most strikingly reproduced the passions of anger and sorrow according to the character of the exercised my wit and tongue. Thy praise, O Lord, thy praises might have propped up the tendrils of my heart by thy scriptures, and it would not have been dragged away by these empty trifles, a shameful prey to the spirits of the air. For there is more than one way in which men sacrifice to the fallen angels. Chapter 18 But it was no wonder that I was thus carried toward vanity and was estranged from thee, O my God, when men were held up as models to me, who, when relating a deed of theirs, not in itself evil, were covered with confusion if found guilty of a barbarism or a solecism, but who could tell of their own licentiousness and be applauded for it, so long as they did it in a full and ornate oration of well-chosen words? Thou seest all this, O Lord, and dost keep silence, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth as thou art. Will thou keep silence forever? Even now thou drawest from that vast deep the soul that seeks thee and thirsts after thy delight, whose heart said unto thee, I have sought thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. For I was far from thy face in the dark shadows of passion, for it is not by our feet, nor by change of place, though I either turn from thee or return to thee. That younger son did not charter horses or chariots or ships, or fly away on visible wings, or journey by walking, so that in the far country he might prodigally waste all that thou didst give when he set out. A kind father, when thou gavest, and kinder still, when he returned destitute. To be wanton, that is to say, to be darkened in heart, this is to be far from thy face. Look down, O Lord God, and see patiently, as thou art wont to do, how diligently the sons of men observe the conventional rules of letters and syllables taught them by those who learned their letters beforehand while they neglect the eternal rules of everlasting salvation taught by thee. They carry it so far that if he who practices or teaches the established rules of pronunciation should speak, contrary to grammatical usage, without aspirating the first syllable of hominem, onimen, thus making it a human being, he will offend men more than if he, a human being, were to hate another human being contrary to thy commandments. It is as if he should feel that there is an enemy who could be more destructive to himself than that hatred which excites him against his fellow man, or that he could destroy him whom he hates more completely than he destroys his own soul by this same hatred. Now, obviously, there is no knowledge of letters more innate than the writing of conscience against doing unto another what one would not have done to himself. How mysterious thou art who dwellest on high in silence! O thou, the only great God, who by an unwearied law hurlest down the penalty of blindness to unlawful desire! When a man seeking the reputation of eloquence stands before a human judge while a thronging multitude surrounds him and inveighs against his enemy with the most fierce hatred, he takes most vigilant heed that his tongue does not slip in grammatical error. For example, and say, inter hominibus, instead of inter homines. But he takes no heed lest, in the fury of his spirit, he cut off a man from his fellow men, ex hominibus. These were the customs in the midst of which I was cast, 
an unhappy boy. This was the wrestling arena in which I was more fearful of perpetrating a barbarism than having done so of envying those who had not. These things I declare and confess to thee, my God. I was applauded by those whom I then thought it my whole duty to please, for I did not perceive the gulf of infamy wherein I was cast away from thy eyes. For in thy eyes what was more infamous than I was already? since I displeased even my own kind and deceived with endless lies my tutor, my masters and parents, all from a love of play, a craving for frivolous spectacles, a stage-struck restlessness to imitate what I saw in those shows. I pilfered from my parents' cellar and table, sometimes driven by gluttony, sometimes just to have something to give to other boys in exchange for their baubles, which they were prepared to sell even though they liked them as well as I. Moreover, in this kind of play I often sought dishonest victories, being myself conquered by the vain desire for preeminence. And what was I so unwilling to endure? And what was it that I censored so violently when I caught anyone except the very things I did to others? And, when I was myself detected and censured, I preferred to quarrel rather than to yield. Is this the innocence of childhood? It is not, O Lord, it is not. I entreat thy mercy, O my God, for these same sins as we grow older are transferred from tutors and masters. They pass from nuts and balls and sparrows to magistrates and kings, to gold and lands and slaves, just as the rod is succeeded by more severe chastisements. It was then the fact of humility in childhood that thou, O our King, didst approve as a symbol of humility when thou saidst, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 19 However, O Lord, to thee, most excellent and most good, thou architect and governor of the universe, thanks would be due thee, O our God even if thou hadst not willed that I should survive my boyhood. For I existed even then. I lived and felt and was solicitous about my own well-being, a trace of that most mysterious unity from whence I had my being. I kept watch, by my inner sense, over the integrity of my outer senses, and even in these trifles and also in my thoughts about trifles, I learned to take pleasure in truth. I was averse to being deceived. I had a vigorous memory. I was gifted with the power of speech, was softened by friendship, shunned sorrow, meanness, ignorance. Is not such an animated creature as this wonderful and praiseworthy? But all these are gifts of my God. I did not give them to myself. Moreover, they are good, and they altogether constitute myself. Good, then, is he that made me, and he is my God. And before him will I rejoice exceedingly for every good gift which, even as a boy, I had. But herein lay my sin, that it was not in him, but in his creatures, myself and the rest, that I sought for pleasures, honors, and truths, and I fell thereby into sorrows, troubles, and errors, Thanks be to thee, my joy, my pride, my confidence, my God. Thanks be to thee for thy gifts, which do thou preserve them in me. For thus wilt thou preserve me, and those things which thou hast given me shall be developed and perfected, and I myself shall be with thee. For from thee is my being. End of Book 1 Confessions by St. Augustine. Book 1, chapters 1 through 10 of The Confessions of St. Augustine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Confessions of St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. Translated by the Rev. E. B. Pusey. Book 1. Confessions of the Greatness and Unsearchableness of God, 
of God's mercies in infancy and boyhood, and human willfulness, of his own sins of idleness, abuse of his studies, and God's gifts up to his fifteenth year. Chapter 1 Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and thy wisdom infinite. And thee would man praise, man, but a particle of thy creation, man, that bears about him his mortality, the witness of his sin, the witness that thou resistest the proud. Yet would man praise thee, he, but a particle of thy creation. Thou awakest us to delight in thy praise, for thou madest us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it repose in thee. Grant me, Lord, to know and understand which is first, to call on thee or to praise thee, and, again, to know thee or to call on thee. For who can call on thee, not knowing thee? For he that knoweth thee not may call on thee as other than thou art. Or is it rather that we call on thee that we may know thee? But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe without a preacher? And they that seek the Lord shall praise him. For they that seek shall find him, and they that find shall praise him. I will seek thee, Lord, by calling on thee, and will call on thee, believing in thee. For to us hast thou been preached. My faith, Lord, shall call on thee, which thou hast given me, wherewith thou hast inspired me, through the incarnation of thy Son, through the ministry of the preacher. Chapter 2 And how shall I call upon my God, my God and Lord, since when I call for him, I shall be calling him to myself? And what room is there within me, whither my God can come into me? Whither can God come into me, God who made heaven and earth? Is there, indeed, O Lord my God, aught in me that can contain thee? Do then heaven and earth, which thou hast made, and wherein thou hast made me, contain thee? Or, because nothing which exists could exist without thee, doth therefore whatever exists contain thee? Since, then, I too exist, why do I seek that thou shouldst enter into me, who were not, wert thou not in me? Why? Because I am not gone down in hell, and yet thou art there also. For if I go down into hell, thou art there. I could not be then, O my God, could not be at all, wert thou not in me. Or, rather, unless I were in thee, of whom are all things, by whom are all things, in whom are all things. Even so, Lord, even so. Whither do I call thee, since I am in thee? Or whence canst thou enter into me? For whither can I go beyond heaven and earth, that thence my God should come into me, who hath said, I fill the heaven and the earth? Chapter 3 do the heaven and the earth then contain thee, since thou fillest them? Or dost thou fill them, and yet overflow, since they do not contain thee? And whither, when the heaven and the earth are filled, pourest thou forth the remainder of thyself? Or hast thou no need that aught contain thee, who containest all things, since what thou fillest, thou fillest by containing it? For the vessels which thou fillest uphold thee not, since... Though they were broken, thou wert not poured out. And when thou art poured out on us, thou art not cast down, but thou upliftest us. Thou art not dissipated, but thou gatherest us. But thou who fillest all things, fillest thou them with thy whole self? Or, since all things cannot contain thee wholly, do they contain part of thee? And all at once the same part? or each its own part, the greater more, the smaller less? And is, then, one part of thee greater, another less? Or art thou holy everywhere, while nothing contains thee holy? Chapter 4 
What art thou then, my God? What, but the Lord God? For who is Lord but the Lord? Or who is God save our God? Most highest, most good, most potent, most omnipotent, most merciful, yet most just, most hidden, yet most present, most beautiful, yet most strong, stable, yet incomprehensible, unchangeable, yet all-changing, never new, never old, all renewing, and bringing age upon the proud, and they know it not, ever working, ever at rest, still gathering, yet nothing lacking, supporting, filling, and overspreading, creating, nourishing, and maturing, seeking, yet having all things. Thou lovest without passion, art jealous without anxiety, repentest, yet grievest not, art angry, yet serene, changest thy works, thy purpose unchanged, receiveth again what thou findest, yet did never lose, never in need, yet rejoicing in gains, never covetous, yet exacting usury. Thou receivest over and above, that thou mayest owe, and who hath aught that is not thine? Thou payest debts, owing nothing, remittest debts, losing nothing. And what have I now said, my God, my life, my holy joy? Or what saith any man when he speaks of thee? Yet woe to him that speaketh not, since mute are even the most eloquent. Chapter 5 Oh, that I might repose on thee! Oh, that thou wouldst enter into my heart and inebriate it, that I may forget my ills and embrace thee, my soul good! What art thou to me? In thy pity teach me to utter it, or what am I to thee that thou demandest my love, and, if I give it not, art wroth with me, and threatenest me with grievous woes? Is it then a slight woe to love thee not? Oh, for thy mercy's sake, tell me, O Lord my God, what thou art unto me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. So speak that I may hear. Behold, Lord, my heart is before thee. Open thou the ears thereof, and say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. After this voice let me haste, and take hold on thee. Hide not thy face from me. Let me die, lest I die, only let me see thy face. Narrow is the mansion of my soul. Enlarge thou it that thou mayest enter in. It is ruinous, repair thou it. It has that within which must offend thine eyes, I confess and know it. But who shall cleanse it, or to whom should I cry save thee? Lord, cleanse me from my secret faults, and spare thy servant from the power of the enemy. I believe, and therefore do I speak. Lord. Thou knowest, have I not confessed against myself my transgressions unto thee, and thou, my God, hast forgiven the iniquity of my heart? I contend not in judgment with thee, who art the truth. I fear to deceive myself, lest mine iniquity lie unto itself. Therefore I contend not in judgment with thee. For if thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall abide it? Chapter 6 Yet suffer me to speak unto thy mercy, me, dust and ashes. Yet suffer me to speak, since I speak to thy mercy, and not to scornful man. Thou too, perhaps, despiseth me, yet wilt thou return and have compassion upon me, for what would I say, O Lord my God, but that I know not whence I came into this dying life, shall I call it, or living death? 
Then immediately did the comforts of thy compassion take me up, as I heard, for I remember it not, from the parents of my flesh, out of whose substance thou didst sometime fashion me. Thus there received me the comforts of woman's milk. For neither my mother nor my nurses stored their own breasts for me, but thou didst bestow the food of my infancy through them, according to thine ordinance, whereby thou distributest thy riches through the hidden springs of all things. Thou also gavest me to desire no more than thou gavest, and to my nurses willingly to give me what thou gavest them. For they, with a heaven-taught affection, willingly gave me what they abounded with from thee. For this my good from them was good for them. Nor, indeed, from them was it, but through them. For from thee, O God, are all good things, and from my God is all my health. This I since learned. Thou, through these thy gifts, within me and without, proclaiming thyself unto me. For then I knew but to suck, to repose in what pleased, and cry at what offended my flesh. Nothing more. Afterwards I began to smile, first in sleep, then waking, for so it was told me of myself, and I believed it. For we see the like in other infants, though of myself I remember it not. Thus, little by little, I became conscious where I was, and to have a wish to express my wishes to those who could content them, and I could not. For the wishes were within me, and they without, nor could they by any sense of theirs enter within my spirit. So I flung about at random limbs and voice, making the few signs I could, and such as I could, like, though in truth very little like, what I wished. And when I was not presently obeyed, my wishes being hurtful or unintelligible, then I was indignant with my elders for not submitting to me, with those owing me no service for not serving me, and avenged myself on them by tears. Such have I learnt infants to be from observing them, and, that I was myself such, they, all unconscious, have shown me better than my nurses who knew it. And lo, my infancy died long since, and I live. But thou, Lord, who for ever livest, and in whom nothing dies, for before the foundations of the worlds, and before all that can be called before, thou art, and art God and Lord of all which thou hast created. In thee abide, fixed for ever, the first causes of all things unabiding, and of all things changeable, the springs abide in thee unchangeable, and in thee live the eternal reasons of all things unreasoning and temporal. Say, Lord, to me, thy supplicant, say, all pitying, to me, thy pitiable one, Say, did my infancy succeed another age of mine that died before it? Was it that which I spent within my mother's womb? For of that I have heard somewhat, and have myself seen women with child. And what before that life again, O God, my joy, was I anywhere or anybody? For this I have none to tell me, neither father nor mother, nor experience of others, nor mine own memory. Dost thou mock me for asking this, and bid me praise thee and acknowledge thee, for that I do know? I acknowledge thee, Lord of heaven and earth, and praise thee for my first rudiments of being, and my infancy, whereof I remember nothing. For thou hast appointed that man should from others guess much as to himself, and believe much on the strength of weak females. Even then I had being and life, and... At my infancy's close, I could seek for signs, whereby to make known to others my sensations. Whence could such a being be, save from thee, Lord? Shall any be his own artificer? Or can there elsewhere be derived any vein which may stream essence and life into us, save from thee, O Lord, in whom essence and life are one? For thou thyself art supremely essence, and life. For thou art most high, and art not changed. 
For neither in thee doth to day come to a close, yet in thee doth it come to a close, because all such things also are in thee. For they had no way to pass away unless thou upheldest them, and since thy years fail not, thy years are one to day. How many of ours and our fathers' years have flowed away through thy to day, and from it received the measure and mould of such being as they had, and still others shall flow away, and so receive the mould of their degree of being. But thou art still the same, and all things of tomorrow, and all beyond, and all of yesterday, and all behind it, thou hast done to-day. What is it to me, though any comprehend not this? Let him also rejoice and say, What thing is this? Let him rejoice even thus, and be content, rather by not discovering, to discover thee, than by discovering, not to discover thee. Chapter 7 Hear, O God, alas for man's sin! So saith man, and thou pitiest him, for thou madest him, but sin in him thou madest not. Who remindeth me of the sins of my infancy? For in thy sight none is pure from sin, not even the infant whose life is but a day upon the earth. Who remindeth me? Does not each little infant, in whom I see what of myself I remember not? What, then, was my sin? Was it that I hung upon the breast and cried? For should I now so do for food suitable to my age, justly should I be laughed at and reproved? What I then did was worthy reproof, but since I could not understand reproof, custom and reason forbade me to be reproved. For those habits, when grown, we root out and cast away. Now no man, though he prunes, wittingly casts away what is good, or was it then good, even for a while, to cry for what, if given, would hurt, bitterly to resent that person's free and its own elders, yea, the very authors of its birth, served it not, that many besides, wiser than it, obeyed not the nod of its good pleasure, to do its best to strike and hurt, because commands were not obeyed, which had been obeyed to its hurt. The weakness, then, of infant limbs, not its will, is its innocence. Myself have seen and known even a baby envious. It could not speak, yet it turned pale and looked bitterly on its foster brother. Who knows not this? Mothers and nurses tell you that they allay these things by I know not what remedies. Is that, too, innocence? when the fountain of milk is flowing in rich abundance, not to endure one to share it, though in extremest need, and whose very life as yet depends thereon. We bear gently with all this, not as being no or slight evils, but because they will disappear as years increase. For, though tolerated now, the very same tempers are utterly intolerable when found in riper years. Thou, then, O Lord my God, who gavest life to this my infancy, furnishing thus with senses, as we see, the frame thou gavest, compacting its limbs, ornamenting its proportions, and, for its general good and safety, implanting in it all vital functions, thou commandest me to praise thee in these things, to confess unto thee, and sing unto thy name, thou most highest. For thou art God, almighty and good. Even hadst thou done naught but only this, which none could do but thou, whose unity is the mould of all things, who out of thine own fairness makest all things fair, and orderest all things by thy law. This age, then, Lord, whereof I have no remembrance, which I take on others' word, and guess from other infants that I have passed, True though the guess be, yet I am loath to count in this life of mine which I live in this world. For no less than that which I spent in my mother's womb is it hid from me in the shadows of forgetfulness. But if I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, where, I beseech thee, O my God, where, Lord, or when, 
was I thy servant guiltless? But, lo, that period I pass by, and what have I now to do with that, of which I can recall no vestige? Chapter 8 Passing hence from infancy, I come to boyhood, or rather it came to me, displacing infancy. Nor did that depart, for whither went it, and yet it was no more. For I was no longer a speechless infant, but a speaking boy. This I remember, and have since observed how I learned to speak. It was not that my elders taught me words, as soon after other learning, in any set method, but I, longing by cries and broken accents and various motions of my limbs to express my thoughts, so that I might have my will, and yet unable to express all I willed, or to whom I willed, did myself, by the understanding which thou, my God, gavest me, practice the sounds in my memory. When they named any thing, and as they spoke turned towards it, I saw and remembered that they called what they would point out, by the name they uttered. And that they meant this thing, and no other, was plain from the motion of their body, the natural language, as it were, of all nations, expressed by the countenance, glances of the eye, gestures of the limbs, and tones of the voice, indicating the affections of the mind, as it pursues, possesses, rejects, or shuns. And thus, by constantly hearing words, as they occurred in various sentences, I collected gradually for what they stood, and having broken in my mouth to these signs, I thereby gave utterance to my will. Thus I exchanged with those about me these current signs of our wills, and so launched deeper into the stormy intercourse of human life, yet depending on parental authority and the beck of elders. Chapter 9 O God, my God! What miseries and mockeries did I now experience when obedience to my teachers was proposed to me, as proper in a boy, in order that in this world I might prosper and excel in tongue science, which should serve to the praise of men and to deceitful riches? Next I was put in school to get learning, in which I, poor wretch, knew not what use there was, and yet, if idle in learning, I was beaten. For this was judged right by our forefathers, and many, passing the same course before us, framed for us weary paths, through which we were fain to pass, multiplying toil and grief upon the sons of Adam. But, Lord, we found that men called upon Thee, and we learnt from them to think of Thee, according to our powers, as of some great one, who, though hidden from our senses, couldst hear and help us. For so I began, as a boy, to pray to thee, my aid and refuge, and broke the fetters of my tongue to call on thee, praying thee, though small, yet with no small earnestness, that I might not be beaten at school. And when thou heardest me not, not thereby giving me over to folly, my elders, yea, my very parents, who yet wished me no ill, mocked my stripes, my then great and grievous ill. Is there, Lord, any of soul so great, and cleaving to thee with so intense affection, for a sort of stupidity will in a way do it? But is there any one who, from cleaving devoutly to thee, is endued with so great a spirit, that he can think as lightly of the racks and hooks, and other torments, against which, throughout all lands, men call on thee with extreme dread, mocking at those by whom they are feared most bitterly, as our parents mocked the torments which we suffered in boyhood from our masters. For we feared not our torments less, nor prayed we less to thee to escape them, and yet we sinned, in writing or reading or studying less than was exacted of us. For we wanted not, O Lord, memory or capacity, whereof thou wilt give enough for our age, but our sole delight was play, and for this we were punished by those who yet themselves were doing the like. But elder folks' idleness is called business, that of boys, being really the same, is punished by those elders, and none commiserates either boys or men. 
For will any of sound discretion approve of my being beaten as a boy, because, by playing at ball, I made less progress in studies, which I was to learn, only that, as a man, I might play more unbeseemingly? And what else did he who beat me, who, if worsted in some trifling discussion with his fellow tutor, was more embittered and jealous than I, when beaten at ball by a playfellow? Chapter 10 And yet, I sinned herein, O Lord God, the Creator and Disposer of all things in nature, of sin the Disposer only, O Lord my God, I sinned in transgressing the commands of my parents and those my masters. For what they, with whatever motive, would have me learn, I might afterward have put to good use. For I disobeyed, not from a better choice, but from love of play, loving the pride of victory in my contests, and to have my ears tickled with lying fables, that they might itch the more, the same curiosity flashing from my eyes more and more, for the shows and games of my elders. Yet those who give these shows are in such esteem that almost all wish the same for their children, and yet are very willing that they should be beaten, if those very games detain them from the studies, whereby they would have them attain to be the givers of them. Look with pity, Lord, on these things, and deliver us who call upon thee now. Deliver those, too, who call not on thee yet, that they may call on thee, and thou mayest deliver them. End of chapter 10 Book 1, chapters 11 to 18 of The Confessions of St. Augustine, translated by E. B. Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Book 1, Chapter 11 As a boy, then, I had already heard of an eternal life, promised us through the humility of the Lord our God, stooping to our pride, and even from the womb of my mother, who greatly hoped in thee, I was sealed with the mark of his cross, and salted with his salt. Thou sawest, Lord, how while yet a boy, being seized on a time with sudden oppression of the stomach, and like near to death, thou sawest, my God, for thou wert my keeper, with what eagerness and what faith I sought, from the pious care of my mother and thy church, the mother of us all, the baptism of thy Christ, my God and Lord. Whereupon the mother of my flesh, being much troubled, since, with a heart pure in thy faith, she even more lovingly travailed in birth of my salvation, would in eager haste have provided for my consecration and cleansing by the health-giving sacraments, confessing thee, Lord Jesus, for the remission of sins, unless I had suddenly recovered. And so, as if I must needs be again polluted, should I live, my cleansing was deferred, because the defilements of sin would, after that washing, bring greater and more perilous guilt. I then already believed, and my mother and the whole household, except my father, Yet did not he prevail over the power of my mother's piety in me, that as he did not yet believe, so neither should I. For it was her earnest care that thou my God, rather than he, shouldst be my father, and in this thou didst aid her to prevail over her husband, whom she, the better, obeyed, therein also obeying thee, who hast so commanded. I beseech thee, my God, I would fain know, if so thou willest, for what purpose my baptism was then deferred. Was it for my good that the rain was laid loose, as it were, upon me for my sin? Or was it not laid loose? If not, why does it still echo in our ears on all sides? Let him alone, let him do as he will, for he is not yet baptized. But as to bodily health, no one says, let him be the worse wounded, for he is not yet healed. How much better, then, had I been at once healed, and then, by my friend's diligence and my own, my soul's recovered health had been kept safe in thy keeping who gavest it. Better truly. But how many and great waves of temptation seemed to hang over me after my boyhood. These my mother foresaw, and preferred to expose to them the clay whence I might afterwards be molded than the very cast when made. Chapter 12 In boyhood itself, however, 
so much less dreaded for me than youth. I loved not study, and hated to be forced to it. Yet I was forced, and this was well done towards me, but I did not well. For, unless forced, I had not learnt. But no one doth well against his will, even though what he doth be well. Yet neither did they well who forced me, but what was well came to me from thee, my God. For they were regardless how I should employ what they forced me to learn, except to satiate the insatiate desires of a wealthy beggary, and a shameful glory. But thou, by whom the very hairs of our head are numbered, didst use for my good the error of all who urged me to learn, and my own, who would not learn, thou didst use for my punishment, a fit penalty for one, so small a boy and so great a sinner. So by those who did not well, thou didst well for me, and by my own sin thou didst justly punish me. For thou hast commanded, and so it is, that every inordinate affection should be its own punishment. Chapter 13 But why did I so much hate the Greek, which I studied as a boy? I do not yet fully know. For the Latin I loved, not what my first masters, but what the so-called grammarians taught me, for those first lessons, reading, writing, and arithmetic, I thought as great a burden and penalty as any Greek. And yet whence was this too, but from the sin and vanity of this life, because I was flesh, and a breath that passeth away and cometh not again? For those first lessons were better, certainly, because more certain. By them I obtained, and still retain, the power of reading what I find written, and myself writing what I will whereas, in the others, I was forced to learn the wanderings of one, Ianus, forgetful of my own, and to weep for dead Dido, because she killed herself for love, the while, with dry eyes, I endured my miserable self-dying among these things, far from thee, O God, my life. For what more miserable than a miserable being who commiserates not himself, weeping the death of Dido for love to Aeneas, but weeping not his own death for want of love to thee, O God. Thou light of my heart, thou bread of my inmost soul, thou power who givest vigor to my mind, who quickenest my thoughts, I loved thee not. I committed fornication against thee, and all around me thus fornicating there echoed, Well done, well done, for the friendship of this world is fornication against thee. And, well done, well done, echoes on till one is ashamed not to be thus a man. And all this I wept not, I who wept for Dido slain, and seeking by the sword a stroke and wound extreme, myself seeking the while a worse extreme, the extremest and lowest of thy creatures, having forsaken thee, earth passing into the earth. And if forbid to read all this, I was grieved that I might not read what grieved me, Madness like this is thought a higher and richer learning than that by which I learned to read and write. But now, my God, cry aloud in my soul, and let thy truth tell me, not so, not so. Far better was that first study. For, lo, I would readily forget the wanderings of Aeneas and all the rest, rather than how to read and write. But over the entrance of the grammar school is a veil drawn. True. Yet is this not so much an emblem of aught recondite as a cloak of error? Let not those whom I no longer fear cry out against me while I confess to thee, my God, whatever my soul will, and acquiesce in condemnation of my evil ways, that I may love thy good ways. Let not either buyers or sellers of grammar learning cry out against me, for if I question them whether it be true that Aeneas came on a time to Carthage, as the poet tells, the less learned will reply that they do not know, the more learned that he never did. But should I ask with what letters the name Aeneas is written, every one who has learnt this will answer me aright, as to the signs which men have conventionally settled. If, again, I should ask, what might be forgotten with least detriment to the concerns of life, reading and writing, or these poetic fictions? Who does not foresee what all must answer who have not wholly forgotten themselves? 
I sinned then, when as a boy I preferred those empty to those more profitable studies, or rather loved the one and hated the other. One and one, two, two and two, four. This was to me a hateful sing-song. The wooden horse lined with armed men, and the burning of Troy, and Croesus' shade and sad similitude, were the choice spectacle of my vanity. Chapter 14 Why, then, did I hate the Greek classics, which have the like tales? For Homer also curiously wove the like fictions, and is mostly sweetly vain, yet was he bitter to my boyish taste. And so I suppose would Virgil be to Grecian children, when forced to learn him as I was Homer. Difficulty in truth, the difficulty of a foreign tongue, dashed, as it were, with gall all the sweetness of Grecian fable. For not one word of it did I understand, and to make me understand I was urged vehemently with cruel threats and punishments. Time was also, as an infant, I knew no Latin, but this I learned without fear or suffering, by mere observation, amid the caresses of my nursery and jests of friends, smiling and sportively encouraging me. This I learned without any pressure of punishment to urge me on, for my heart urged me to give birth to its conceptions, which I could only do by learning words not of those who taught, but of those who talked with me, in whose ears also I gave birth to the thoughts, whatever I conceived. No doubt, then, that a free curiosity has more force in our learning these things than a frightful enforcement. Only this enforcement restrains the rovings of that freedom through thy laws, O my God, thy laws, from the master's cane to the martyr's trials, being able to temper us for a wholesome bitter, recalling us to thyself from that deadly pleasure which lures us from thee. Chapter 15 Hear, Lord, my prayer. Let not my soul faint unto thy discipline, nor let me faint confessing unto thee all thy mercies, whereby thou hast drawn me out of all my most evil ways, that thou mightst become a delight to me above all the allurements which I once pursued, that I may most entirely love thee, and clasp thy hand with all my affections, and thou mayest yet rescue me from every temptation, even unto the end. For lo, O Lord, my King and my God, for thy service be whatever useful thing my childhood learned. For thy service, that I speak, write, read, reckon. For thou didst grant me thy discipline, while I was learning vanities, and my sin of delighting in those vanities thou hast forgiven. In them, indeed, I learnt many a useful word, but these may as well be learned in things not vain, and that is the safe path for the steps of youth. Chapter 16 But woe is thee, thou torrent of human custom! Who shall stand against thee? How long shalt thou not be dried up? How long roll the sons of Eve into that huge and hideous ocean, which even they scarcely overpass who climb the cross? Did I not read in thee of Jove, the thunderer and the adulterer? But, doubtless, he could not be. But so the feigned thunder might countenance and pander to real adultery. And now which of our gowned masters lends a sober ear to one from whom their own school cries out, these were Homer's fictions, transferring things human to the gods. Would he had brought down things divine to us? Yet more truly had he said, These are indeed his fictions, but attributing a divine nature to wicked man, that crimes might be no longer crimes, and whoso commits them might seem to imitate not abandoned men, but the celestial gods. And yet, thou hellish torrent, into thee are cast the sons of men with rich rewards, for compassing such learning. And a great solemnity is made of it, when this is going on in the forum, within sight of laws appointing a salary beside the scholar's payments, and thou lashest thy rocks and roarest. Hence words are learned, hence eloquence, most necessary to gain your ends, or maintain opinions. As if we should have never known such words as golden shower, lap, beguile, temples of the heavens, or others in that passage, 
unless Terence had brought a lewd youth upon the stage, setting up Jupiter as his example of seduction. Viewing a picture, where the tale was drawn, of Jove's descending in a golden shower, to Danae's lap, a woman to beguile. And then mark how he excites himself to lust as by celestial authority. And what God, great Jove, who shakes heaven's highest temples with his thunder, and I, poor mortal man, not do the same. I did it, and with all my heart I did it. Not one whit more easily are the words learnt for all this vileness, but by their means the vileness is committed with less shame. Not that I blame the words being, as it were, choice and precious vessels, but that wine of air which is drunk to us in them by intoxicated teachers. And if we, too, drink not, we are beaten, and have no sober judge to whom we may appeal. Yet, O oh my God, in whose presence I now without hurt may remember this, all this unhappily I learnt willingly with great delight, and for this was pronounced a hopeful boy. Chapter 17 Bear with me, my God, while I say somewhat of my wit, thy gift, and on what dotages I wasted it. For a task was set me, troublesome enough to my soul, upon terms of praise or shame, and fear of stripes, to speak the words of Juno, as she raged and mourned that she could not, this Trojan prince, from Latium turn. Which words I had heard Juno never uttered, but we were forced to go astray in the footsteps of these poetic fictions, and to say in prose much what he expressed in verse. And his speaking was most applauded, in whom the passions of rage and grief were most preeminent, and clothed in the most fitting language, maintaining the dignity of the character. What is it to me, O oh my true life, my God, that my declamation was applauded above so many of my own age and class? Is not all this smoke and wind? And was there nothing else whereon to exercise my wit and tongue? Thy praises, Lord. Thy praises might have stayed the yet tender shoot of my heart by the prop of thy scriptures, so had it not trailed away amid these empty trifles, a defiled prey for the fowls of the air. For in more ways than one do men sacrifice to the rebellious angels. Chapter 18 But what marvel that I was thus carried away to vanities, and went out from thy presence, O my God, when men were set before me as models, who, if in relating some action of theirs, in itself not ill, they committed some barbarism or solecism, being censured, were abashed. But when in rich and adorned and well-ordered discourse they related to their own disordered life, being bepraised, they gloried. These things thou seest, Lord, and holdest thy peace, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Wilt thou hold thy peace for ever, and even now thou drawest out of this horrible gulf the soul that seeketh thee, that thirsteth for thy pleasures, whom heart saith unto thee, I have sought thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. For darkened affections is removal from thee. For it is not by our feet, or change of place, that men leave thee, or return unto thee, or did that thy younger son look out for horses or chariots, or ships fly with invisible wings, or journey by the motion of his limbs, that he might in a fair country waste in riotous living all thou gavest at his departure. A loving father, when thou gavest, and more loving unto him when he returned empty. So then in lustful, that is, in darkened affections, is the true distance from thy face. Behold, O Lord God, yea, Behold patiently as thou art wont, how carefully the sons of men observe the covenanted rules of letters and syllables received from those who spake before them, neglecting the eternal covenant of everlasting salvation received from thee, insomuch that a teacher or learner of the hereditary laws of pronunciation will more offend man by speaking without the aspirate of an human being, in desperate of the laws of grammar, than if he, a human being, hate a human being in despite of thine. 
and if any enemy could be more hurtful than the hatred with which he is incensed against him, or who could wound more deeply him whom he persecutes than he wounds his own soul by his enmity. Assuredly no science of letters can be so innate as the record of conscience, that he is doing to another what from another he would be loath to suffer. How deep are thy ways, O God, thou only great, that sitteth silent on heaven by an unwearied law dispensing penal blindness to lawless desires. In quest of the fame of eloquence, a man standing before a human judge, surrounded by a human throng, declaiming against his enemy with fiercest hatred, will take heed most watchfully, lest, by an error of the tongue, he murder the word human being, but takes no heed lest, through the fury of his spirit, he murder the real human being. This was the world at whose gate unhappily I lay in my boyhood, this the stage where I had feared more to commit a barbarism than having committed one to envy those who had not. These things I speak and confess to thee, my God, for which I had praise from them whom I thought it all virtue to please. For I saw not the abyss of vileness wherein I was cast away from thine eyes. Before them what more foul than I was already displeasing even such as myself? With innumerable lies deceiving my tutor, my masters, my parents, from love of play, eagerness to see vain shows, and restlessness to imitate them. Thefts also I committed from my parents' cellar and table, enslaved by greediness, or that I might have to give to boys who sold me their play, which all the while they liked no less than I. In this play, too, I often sought unfair conquests, conquered myself meanwhile by vain desire of preeminence. And what could I so ill endure, or, when I detected it, upbraided I so fiercely, as that I was doing to others? And for which, if detected, I was upbraided, I chose rather to quarrel than to yield. And is this the innocence of boyhood? Not so, Lord, not so. I cry thy mercy, O my God. For these very sins, as riper years succeed, these very sins are transferred from tutors and masters, from nuts and balls and sparrows, to magistrates and kings, to gold and manners and slaves. Just as severer punishments displace the cane. It was the low stature, then, of childhood, which thou our king didst commence an emblem of lowliness, when thou saidst, of such is the kingdom of heaven. Yet, Lord, to thee, the creator and governor of the universe, most excellent and most good, thanks were due to thee, our God, even hadst thou destined for me a boyhood only. For even then I was, I lived and felt, and had an implanted providence over my own well-being, a trace of that mysterious unity whence I was derived, I guarded by the inward sense the entireness of my senses, and in these minute pursuits, and in my thoughts on things minute, I learnt to delight in truth, I hated to be deceived, had a vigorous memory, was gifted with speech, was soothed by friendship, avoided pain, baseness, ignorance. In so small a creature, what was not wonderful, not admirable? But all are gifts of my God. It was not I, who gave them me, and good these are, and these together are myself. Good, then, is he that made me, and he is my good, and before him will I exult for every good which of a boy I had. For it was my sin, that not in him, but in his creatures, myself and others, I sought for pleasures, sublimities, truths, and so fell headlong into sorrows, confusions, errors. Thanks be to thee, my joy and my glory and my confidence. My God, thanks be to thee for thy gifts. But do thou preserve them to me, for so wilt thou preserve me, and these things shall be enlarged and perfected, which thou hast given me, and I myself shall be with thee, since even to be thou hast given me. End of Book One